Um, my family are farmers and landowners in both Cumbria and in Argyll. Now, we see ourselves as stewards of a couple of pretty beautiful places, and we want to leave them in better condition for future generations. And frankly, you may say people own land, but actually, in my experience, all you can really do if you care about it is to look after it well, and in one se that sense, it tends to own you rather than the other way around. And also, for a number of years, I was a non-executive director of H&H &H in Carlisle, who are the UK's largest livestock auctioneers based in Carlisle. Now, in my opinion, I'm a businessman as well, but in, I want to talk to you about farming, really. Because in my opinion, livestock farmers must be one of the groups who've been the most deceived by Brexiteers. Just like elsewhere, Brexiteers chose to deceive people who felt aggrieved. Now, why on earth would farmers feel aggrieved? Well, emotionally, especially smaller family farmers, they like the sound of Brexit. They find coping with regulations in the modern world really tough. And like small business people, they have extra red tape and just put yourself in their shoes. There's a ton of regulations. Employment law, pensions law, health and safety. Health and safety is critical in farming. It has far higher levels of accidents and, in fact, death in farming than any other sector. And then there's environmental issues on water, on fertiliser use, on runoff into rivers and streams, on diesel spillages, on building risks, on handling cattle, which is quite dangerous, on animal health and welfare, on buildings, on cattle handling, because cattle can harm you quite easily. Um, you've got to constantly monitor your stock. You've got to make sure you understand where, where your cattle is, what you've moved, and you've got huge penalties for not paying attention to that. You've got notifiable diseases, just in case you might get foot and mouth or lots of other things. You've got to comply with any environmental schemes you've been signed up to. You've got to maintain your fences. You've got to comply with the insurance. You've got to maintain your machinery. You've got to check your ladders. You've got to ensure all your employees are current with all the required courses. They're fully trained. They understand the risks and the law. And it goes on and on. And therefore, farmers dream of a far simpler world. And of course, encouraged by 40 years of a campaign against the EU, they blame bureaucrats, and they particularly blame European ones. And the penalties for farmers for non-compliance are huge. Massive liability claims, potentially, and potentially they're at risk from losing tens of thousands of pounds, even hundreds of thousands of pounds, for cross-compliance penalties. And that's where you don't obey the regulations. Regularly, farmers in this country are fined far more for cross-compliance penalties than bankers were for the issues they caused in the last big bust happens all the time. And it's a real and ever-present risk which can destroy their families and their business. To give you an idea, the health and safety executive can fine a farmer up to £450,000 in a farm if they have a turnover of under £2 million. It's huge. You can lose all your subsidies for two years just for a foolish error. So the Pied Pipers of Brexit, they promised a new light-touch regulation. Well, the farmers like the sound of that. Well, what's not to like? The Brexiteer leaders also promised that farmers would be looked after financially. But Michael Gove, in the referendum campaign, as usual, spoke out of both sides of his mouth. And he also promised that a global trade would bring cheaper food to Britain out of a protectionist Europe. Now he wants, in the words of the Scottish Farmer magazine, to outgreen the EU. So just in the last week, an almighty row has broken out in the Cabinet. Michael Gove, speaking now out of the other side of his mouth, promised protection for farmers in the event of hard Brexit, and he gave them assurances. But the very next day, Philip Hammond, the Chancellor, rebuked Gove, saying that these assurances weren't cleared with the Treasury, and that Hammond believed that farmers, not consumers in this instance, should bear the cost of a no-deal Brexit. <coughs> so what do farmers, or at least those in Scotland and in Cumbria and Northumberland, which I know about, who read The Scottish Farmer and other things, now know about Brexit two and a half years after the referendum. Well, firstly, farmers know that hard Brexit would be an absolute disaster for livestock farmers, in particular sheep farmers. We produce far more sheep meat than we consume. These exports are vital, and 94% of them go to the EU. In the event of hard Brexit, the tariff on these exports would be north of 40% and would be likely to be immediately undercut in this vital market by New Zealand. In England alone, 4.5 million sheep would have no market. 
And we need to remember that in the 1960s and the early 1970s, France closed their markets to our sheep meat. And secondly, they know that agricultural subsidies will be cut. Now, you may not believe that agricultural subsidies are necessarily worthwhile, but for the small farmers, they're absolutely vital. And they'll actually be cut to some extent immediately, with further cuts by 22-23. But we know that the real agenda is to cut these subsidies to zero. Michael Gove is advised by a guy called Dieter Helm, and he's an Oxford economist who derides agricultural subsidies and, frankly, everything that makes a family farm viable, including inheritance tax relief. In Helm's world, you can get inheritance tax relief on owning a portfolio of AIM shares or by owning a business, but you can't get it for a farm. Frankly, Dieter Helm hates traditional rural Britain. Gove preaches a lot about innovation farming. Well, there is a limit to innovation farming. I tell you, especially sheep farming. I mean, do you think Michael Gove is going to invent the, uh, the sheep with eight back legs? Or somehow, I don't think he's going to succeed. Thirdly, they know that no family livestock farm can survive without subsidies. It's a simple fact that no family farm is profitable or viable. There is an example of subsidies being removed, and that is in New Zealand in the late 1980s. It resulted in vast farms being created, owned by corporations or a tiny number of very rich individuals. It resulted in mass bankruptcy of existing farmers, depopulation, far lower animal welfare standards. And frankly, these big farms, they don't actually look after the animals. If it's sick, they shoot it. That's exactly what they do. They never, they never treat them. And environmental problems due to intensified farming. Fourthly, farmers have realised that to get this subsidy cut, Gove, in fact, has invented a kind of green plating of his reforms. He stated there will be public money for what he describes as public goods. And then he waffles, because nothing is specific. All is warm, soft soap. He implies that payments will be made for environmental schemes, for carbon capture, but he never gives any figures. So farmers now know that Gove's assurances aren't worth the paper they're not written on. And at the end of this last week, the former UKIP member and uh, the DEFRA minister, George Eustace, he promised support. Ah, oh, now this week he's gone. Fifthly, they know that standards will not be reduced. So all the bureaucracy and red, red tape will stay. In fact, Gove now promises higher animal welfare standards and environmental standards. And in fact, there's likely to be duplication. What on earth is the point of leaving the UK if you can't have different standards? But then when we export to the EU, you're going to have to have the same standards, so you're going to have another layer. And sickly, they know that Gove and the Brexiteers really have a radical anti-farming agenda. Gove publishes reports suggesting that cows farting causes climate change rather than necessarily uh, motor cars, whereas the science shows that cows farting only remain in the atmosphere for two years, he proposed reducing the sheep and cattle population in the UK by 50% for no environmental reason whatsoever. And in fact, cattle and sheep are great for biodiversity and soil health for birds and insects. And actually, frankly, in my opinion, he encourages a vegan factory-produced diet with absolutely no evidence that it's healthier, when indeed the science generally points to it being extremely unhealthy, as the human body is an extremely effective machine for turning sugar, and that's basically carbohydrates like in wheat grains and potatoes, into fat. Um, before you decide I'm a bit anti-environmental, I want to tell you we farm in Argyll, but almost all an SSSI. Now, the, uh, the point about the world that we're in is that leading Brexiteers so sold Brexit to farmers on one premise, but the reality is completely different. They sold a vision of protection of jobs to millions of working people, but the reality is the Brexiteers want to expose everybody to a continuous blast of completely free trade. They advocate an ultra-low tax, free trade, Singapore on the Atlantic vision for Britain, but they fail to point out, as the Prime Minister of Singapore said, that would involve a two-thirds cut to public expenditure, so no NHS, no welfare state, and a cut to pensions in real terms. In my opinion, these Brexiteers have a very radical and revolutionary agenda, which is to eliminate most of the things the state does. A world where the super-rich do as they like, as the sovereign individuals foreseen in Rees Mogg's father's book of that name. So if you're not in favour of that neocon kind of world, you need to get organised. A very part, considerable part of the Conservative Party really has been taken over by people who are fanatical about this view. 
Now, I watched some of these ghastly Tory unemployables when a student at Oxford. And frankly, when normal people like me, or I think I'm vaguely normal, were drinking, recovering from drinking, occasionally working in a panic, playing footy, table footy or footy under the table, they were holed up in the Oxford Union and the Oxford University Conservative Association, expanding views which, frankly, were right of Norman Tebbit. We never thought they should be allowed out, let alone running our country off a cliff. I find it terrifying that they're in charge. So please do your best to wrest control back from them. I'm trying my best by a campaign of letters and action, particularly in Cumbria, and I think we're doing quite well, actually. So take a peek at the Scottish farmer if you think that Scottish farmers are now in favour of Brexit, because you'll find that in a poll, 53% of them are actually in favour of a, another referendum, and only 30% of them are in favour of a hard Brexit. So the mood has changed. And one of the things I say about this conference is I think you're pessimistic about the mood in this country because I'm pe I think you're pessimistic because you don't know quite what's been going on in social media. Because certainly from my children, what they show me is there has been a remarkable campaign of mocking of the Brexiteers. And I think that's more powerful than all sorts of other things. So I really truly believe that in a second referendum, there is a good chance that we would get the right result. Now, I don't know what the other answer is, because frankly, unless we have a second referendum, then people like me and other people perhaps in the audience, we aren't going to think it's the right answer. British firms, no one else isn't going to think it's the right answer. So frankly, I think we've got a campaign for a second referendum. We've got to make sure we sell the advantages of being in the EU. And hey, we've had a, some very good speeches about that. And we should be confident about that. Thank you very much. <laughs>